Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on us once again. You are so welcome in this place. We invite you in. Come on in. Do what you do. Have your way. We will get out of the way that you can have your way. Rule, abide, and reign this morning. Father, we thank you. We love you. We appreciate you. We adore you. You do so much for us each and every day, Father God. We thank you, Father God. We give you our all in all, Father God. We love you. We appreciate you. We adore you. We can't say it enough. Ten thousand tongues is not enough. Hallelujah, somebody. Hallelujah, somebody. Hallelujah. We walk in darkness. We lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. May the Lord bless the readers, hears, and doers of his holy word. Amen. Amen.
But uh, you know, like life, every good thing must come to an end. <laughs> so, uh, the Lord willing, I might be leaving. So, keep me in prayers, keep my family in prayers. Uh, I'm going to California for a month, and then I will come back, and then I will pack up, and then I will leave wherever the army wants to take me. Amen. So, but until then, keep praying for us. Amen? Amen. 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 All right, if you can, please stand. Let's go into the Word. We're going to read the text, and then we're going to get into the Word, because I know time is fast, but, Um Turn with me to the book of First John. It's a letter. First John, chapter 1. And we're going to read from verses 5 to 10. First John, chapter 1, verses 5 to 10. It reads, if we say, sorry, my, 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 okay, okay. here we go. And this is the message that we have heard from him. And, and announce to you, God is light. And there is no darkness in him at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie in the truth and we do not do the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship on the earth fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Yes. And verse 8 says, if we say we have no sin, then we deceive our neighbors. Is that what the text says? We deceive the pastors. We deceive the chaplains. We deceive our parents. It says we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 10 says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a lie, and his word is not in us. Dear God, we thank you. Fill this place even more with your presence. Touch our hearts. Give us the ability, Lord, to hear your word. And not only to hear them, Lord, but to internalize them. Lord, that it would permeate our whole being, Lord. And that we will shine like you, Jesus. That others may see and glorify you. Use me now, Lord, as an instrument to speak to your people. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Please have your seat. One afternoon, Moses is on Mount Sinai and he's having a conversation with God. An intimate, unique conversation with God. You know what I mean, right? You're talking to God, God is talking back to you. And there's a, there's a back and forth going on. Moses is having fun. He's enjoying himself, having a conversation with God. And out of a sudden, Moses said to God, show me your glory. That's scary. Coming from a mortal being, tell a divine being, show me your glory. In other words, Moses was telling God, I want to see you face to face. I don't want this cloud that you've got between us. I want you to remove the cloud. Let me behold your glory. Then we started new series on walking in the light, out of darkness. And for the purpose of this sermon, I want to say, if only you knew, if only you knew, 
If when Moses knew what he was asking God, Moses is telling God, he's demanding of God, show me who you are. I want to know you. I want to see you as you are. But watch this. Our God is so gracious. Even when we ask him of something that is so impossible, he has a way. You know, my little daughter, she turned 10. She does some things. I looked out at baby girl. I've been here for 46 years. You're not even one year. You can't do that. But because I love her so much, I tried to, to, to provide some other means just to accommodate her. You know what I'm saying? So Moses asking God something impossible. Hear what God says to Moses. He said, hey, I will cause my goodness, my glory to pass you by. But watch this. You cannot see me, Moses. He said, I will, I will place you in the cliff of the rock. Now, if I'm placing you in the cliff of the rock, I'm going to cover you with my hands. That's what I'm preaching to a church this morning. Yeah. That's what I'm preaching to people who know God. God is saying, even though what you ask of me is impossible, but I'm going to make your vision anyway. Yes, I know you don't need to see me because I want you to live, but since you want to see me, I will make provision to entertain your request. So watch this. Now, I'm a human. I'm a limit of the human thoughts. So I'm thinking, how can I put my hand on your face and walk at the same time? Oh no, so you didn't get it. You didn't get it. You didn't get it. I will just celebrate all by myself. You see, God said, I will put you in the cliff and cover you with my hands and walk past you. Oh no, you didn't get it. So I will I will I will I will come on the side. God said, Moses, I will put you in the cliff of the rock, cover you with my hands, and walk past you. Look at God. Look at God. Look at God. It. it takes a God who can be all over everywhere at the same time to do that. We can do it. He said, I will place my hand on your face and walk past you. So you can see my back. So you don't die, Moses. Because no man sees me. Now, now, I'm studying, I'm studying in chapter. I'm studying, I'm thinking, but why is Moses making so? God is talking to you, Moses. He chose you. Then it dawned on me that Moses wanted to know God. Let no God. Are you with me? Yes. It don't mean that Moses said that if I'm going to keep speaking to the Israelites, I need to know you intimately. I need to be able to tell whoever asks me about you in ways that they have never experienced. If I am the Bible teacher and I'm teaching the Bible it's just how everyone else teaches the Bible, there's a problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I can do this all by myself. If I'm in the chapel and I'm preaching the way everyone else is preaching, Jesus, there is a problem. You see, when the chaplain preaches, you tell the difference between the chaplain and the ordinary member. So Moses is saying, God, if I will stand in front of the congregation and tell them about your goodness and tell them about your glory, then I need to experience what they have not. But furthermore, furthermore, Moses, has he ever heard the word grill? Does anyone know what a grill is? Grill is a person who preserves the genealogy of his tribe, of the family. A grill is somebody you go to, he's like a living, working library. A grill tells you the history, the lineage, everything, the tradition of that village. So when you enter the village, the first person you want to find is the grill. The grill usually they are young, they are all young men that are recruited by an older grill and trained all his life. When the tribe, when the cheetah is, is captured, you don't kill the grill. Because if you kill the grill, it's like you're burning a loud bird. But the grill is 
is responsible of learning as much as he can. He learned different families, the traditions, the war, and, 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 and habits and tricks. He learned everything so he can be able to bequeath to incoming generation what the traditions are. So Moses' demand from God is that God, I need to know you more. So I can tell incoming generation of who you are. Now, we see in here, this morning, in our text, John tells us, he says that I want to tell you a message. I want to announce to you a message. This message is that God is light. There is no darkness in God. John is the only surviving apostle of Jesus Christ that is living at this time. And as a real, he needs to pass on to incoming generation his experience with God. So he says, he says in 1 John chapter 1, he says that, listen to what he says, he says that we proclaim to you the one who existed from the beginning, who we have heard and seen. We saw him with our own eyes. We touched him with our own hands. He is the word of life. This one is life itself. It's revealed to us and we have seen him. And now we testify and proclaim to you that he is the one who is eternal life. He was with the Father and was revealed to us. We proclaim to you that we proclaim to you what we, we ourselves have actually seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father. What is John talking about? John says that we learn these things. We saw Jesus. We touched him. We experienced him. We heard him. All this knowledge that I have acquired over the years with Jesus are now equipped. I'm passing it on to you. So John goes on to say, you need to understand God is light. The New Testament is divided into three sections. Can I teach you a little bit? Yes. Can I teach you a little bit? I know sometimes a lot of preach, but let me teach you a little bit. Is that all right? Three, three different sections. You have AD 1 to AD 33. That's when Jesus was here. There was no Bible written. There was no New Testament written. Let's put it that way. We had the Old Testament. There was no New Testament book written. Then you have from 3 AD 33 to, to AD 60. That's when you have the Pentecost. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That era. Then from AD 60 to AD 100. Now all, most of the disciples have died. John is probably the only person. And you, when you read the Bible to understand scripture and be able to interpret scripture the right way, you need to read it in era or historical context. What happened at the time? So when you talk about 86 to 800, what was going on at the moment? Now, there is a delay. Because the people thought that Jesus would have come by then. They are weary. They are anxious. They are frustrated. Their loved ones are dying. What do we do? Not only that, the disciples are also dying. But we tell you guys what they hope for us. We tell you guys for Jesus. How are you leaving us? There's confusion. There's also these Greek philosophies, the Greek mindset, the Greek thoughts, and all of these things are pulling and creeping into the church. There's a leadership problem. We have all the different believes creeping into the church. So if you were given an opportunity to write scripture and you live in that era, what would you write about? Are you with me? Now, let me bring it home. Can I bring it home? Today, if someone was to say, hey, I gave you the opportunity to write scripture, what would you write about today? Help me out. Right now, if God said, I'm going to inspire you to ask, how many, how many books you got in the Bible? Huh? 66. 65? 66. Oh, oh, 66. So what if God tells you, I want you to add another book to the Bible, what would you write? What would be the topic, what would be the doctrine of topics that you address?
Well, I, I, can, I can name a few, but I don't want to get in trouble. Mm -hmm. it, when you talk about homosexuality, when you talk about gay and lesbian, when you talk about uh, women ordination, when you talk about war, when you talk about conflict, when you talk about human trafficking, when you talk about all of these things, the proliferation of immorality, when you talk about greed, when you talk about these things. Are you with me? Yes. Is that what you do? I'm, I'm not, I'm just saying something. Is that what you're going to write about? So John is writing about what is prevailing during his time. So John said, I understand these things are creeping in the church, but let me tell you, if you're going to survive this, you need to understand who you serve. God is light. John said, well, I'm, that's what I'm going to start this whole conversation. I'm not going to beat around the bush. I want you to know who God is. He is what? Light. And there is no darkness in him. Yeah. Yeah. What does that mean? Yeah. What does that mean, John? You see, in this passage, John gave us three essential theological principles that he wants us to lay back. Are you with me? Yeah. I don't want to keep you long. Three essential principles that John gave us. The first principle is that the nature and being of God, God's nature and being, define the ethical and moral standards of human life. Are you with me? John is saying that your existence, what defines you is not the chaplain. What defines you is God, his being, and his nature. God is life. There is no darkness in him. He is the standard. John is telling us that if we will live according to the will and power of God, we need to understand who he is. And God is light. There is no darkness in him. Are you with me? If there's no darkness in God, and he says that if you're walking with him and there is darkness in you, then there's a problem. So, everything that is creeping into the church, John will go on to have you in his letter. He said, test the spirit. Don't trust every spirit. Because John is saying that if God is light, and you profess to be in fellowship with God, and your attitude is so dark, John is saying, well, I don't need to tell you. You are deceiving yourself. John says, God is life. God is righteous. God is internal. God is infinite. God is all powerful. God is merciful. God is gracious. God is holy. God is true. God has unconditional love. God is faithful. God is light. So if you have a fellowship with God, John says, these are the things which you see in if you walk with God, these are the things that like the fruit of the Spirit. These are the things that you exude. So therefore, the argument is that when you walk away from God, when you turn away from God, when you decide to go your own way, you are walking away from grace. You are walking away from mercy. You are walking away from unforgiveness. You are walking away from the tender love of God. That's the argument that John is making. Yes, there will be false doctrine, there will be antichrist, there will be false teachers. They will come, but when they come, know that your God is the author of love, the author of He's not the author of confusion, He's the author of, 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 of unity, He's the author of everything good. So when you sense anything that is contrary to that, please, it's not of Him. God is not the author of confusion. He's the author of love. The devil is the author of confusion. The devil is the author of hostility. The devil is the author of hatred and envy. The devil is the author of sin. The devil is the author of immorality. God is light. And the thing that blew my mind is that John tried to tell us that light and darkness 
Don't go away late. Are you with me? They cannot be in the same room. Where there is light, darkness flees. So if you see that your life is consumed by darkness, you find the light. Look at where the light is and see how your life will be transformed. John says, they can for us. The light is God. The second theological principle that John gave us in this passage is that Jesus' atoning death is central to having fellowship with God. Are you with me? The death that Jesus died on Calvary, John is saying that that death is central, is essential to your salvation. John says that if you subtract Jesus' death from the equation of salvation, there's no salvation. Church is silent on me. Maybe we need to have a quiet thing, one more song. <laughs> wake up because I really want you to understand what we're talking about here. John is saying to you the reason why you can call on God's holy name is because Jesus died. Yeah. It is his blood that pleases us. Yeah. It is not ourselves. John said that that death on the cross. It's the one that set you free. It's the one that gave you the opportunity to call on God's name. It's the one that gave you the opportunity to approach the throne of grace with boldness. John is saying that that death is central to the gospel. John. Jesus himself died you. Greater love hath no man than this. That a man laid down his life for his friends. In other words, the cross is at the heart of the gospel. Are you with me? The cross is what we stand on. So John is saying that God is light. No darkness in God. So if you approach God on your own, you will be conformed. That's the argument. If you dare approach God without this cross, God's darkness will consume you. But the only reason why you and I can approach the throne of grace and stand in the presence of God and look him in the face and call him Father is because there is an atonement death. See today, people try to argue that I don't need Jesus. <laughs> Who are you? Do you understand what John is saying? If you don't need Jesus, then you must have already died. Because God is so holy in his pure glory that you and I cannot stay in front of him. We cannot go. The word that John used is paraclete. Uh, in the Greek, it means advocate. It's a legal term that was borrowed by the writers. It means that before you go to the job, you need a seasoned lawyer. Mm -hmm. Because your crown is so severe, there's no way you can get out of that courtroom for yeah. yeah. sentence of death. So the writer says that in order to go out there, you need an advocate. You need a seasoned lawyer who can stand and argue your case. And tell the judge, listen, I understand what Solomon did. Listen, I understand that he lied. Listen, I understand that he is a sinner. Listen, I understand he's a murderer. Listen, I understand he's a fornicator. Listen, I understand he's a liar. Listen, I understand everything about Solomon. <coughs> I'll pay for him. Everything he owes me. Put it on my bed. Are you with me? Yeah. I have stand in place of Solomon. Let him go and give him a second chance. Put it on me. I pay for it. Last week we talked about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus is on the cross. His father turned his face around. Not because the father was disgusted of him. The father was disgusted of my sin and your sin. Because he worked for me. He knew what was going on, but he did not allow his feelings 
to get in your way. You know, sometimes, those of you that marry, you know, sometimes your spouse gets in your feelings. You know, how can you get in your feelings and you're not laying on your same bed? It's uncomfortable. I mean, we must have talked about it. Because it's uncomfortable to be in a little space and you got your feelings and you don't want to judge me when I'm feeling it. Hey, come on, baby. Don't judge me. Yeah. Can we talk about it and move on? Jesus understands that his feeling was not enough. You remember when he prayed that God was asleep? His feelings came to be, his feelings came to the suffering. God, I understand what you want me to do. Can we find another way around? God said, no, 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 override. You must go through it. You have to go through it because the life of my children, their salvation, depends on it. You have to put your feelings aside. The gospel is not about feelings. If I feel like it, I come to church. No, it's not about your feelings. If I feel like it, I pay my tithes and offering. No, it's not about your feelings. If I feel like it, I will do. No, it's not about your feelings. God overrides your feelings. You see, if you love me, Keep my commandments. That's override. It's not about your feelings. Some days I don't want to come up in here. Some days I just want to lie in bed. I leave my house every day, seven days a week. I'm not kidding you. Every day I leave my house. I have 27 days youth or loot. I went to my ex and said, How did you get 27 days youth or loot? I said, Because I want to take vacation. I'm just working. You said, no, child, you got to do something by yourself. I don't like it. But I feel poor. I feel I need to do something. And sometimes, child, you need to help me. I need to just get up and go on a vacation. It's not about our feelings. Jesus' death on Calvary was not about feelings. It's about you and myself. He understands that our salvation was on the line. So, he says, I must die on the cross. I must. You know, the songwriter, uh, the, the, the songwriter got a, uh, there's a song that I, I, don't, I can sing, so I, I struggle with it last night. I try to like, say, oh, I'm going to sing this thing there. Oh, I said, no, don't do that. Don't embarrass yourself. <laughs> don't, don't do it. I said, but well, I still even in Mary and my pastor, and I said, yeah, I can sing this song. I said, the lyrics are not that deep. It's not that deep. I can just say, like, no, 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 follow me. Stay in your lane. <laughs> I, I'm arguing with the Holy Spirit. Uh, minister, I said, no, no, no. I think I can borrow a little. He said, no, Solomon, I did not give it to you. Don't see it. Stay in your room. Don't embarrass him. Don't embarrass him. He said, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. Can somebody help me with that, please? Do we have singles in the house? Do we have musicians in the house? Somebody raise that thing. You see that here? Is it? Help me out. Somebody say. Try it again now.
theological principle that John addressed in this passage. John says, are you with me? Do I still have your attention? John says to deny the reality of things makes God a liar and a hinders our fellowship with God. I wonder how the rest of the world. I'm going to have to leave you. John says, John says, John says that to deny the reality hmm, of sin makes God a lie. What does that mean? We live in a society today. Can I come close? Yeah, yeah. I want to deny the existence of sin. Yeah. We live in a world today where the word sin is become anathema. Oh, that's a good word. I like it. Oh, it just came out. It just came out. I don't know how it came out, but it's, it's anathema. It's a taboo. Don't, don't talk about it. Don't, don't bring that word in here. Nobody wants to acknowledge that we live in a world that is saturated, immersed, submerged in sin. Oh, I, I'm loving it. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. It's, the word is consumed and engulfed by sin. But the word does not want to acknowledge that we have sin. So, so we make excuses. We, say, we talk about nature and nurture. Have you heard the argument? Yeah. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about? Nature and nurture. Oh, why are these persons occupied? Why are they living? They grew up together. Why this person is occupied? Oh, that father was not in their life. Why this person is all oh, that mother was drunk at it? Man, get out of here. They are sinners. <laughs> Just say, call them by his name. You are acting crazy because you are what? A sinner. You know. When we refuse to acknowledge our sin, the Bible says we make God a lie. That is so scary. So how does how does that work? When I fail to acknowledge my sin, I make God a lie. The Bible says, for all I say, huh? And for sure of what? No, the Bible says, some people. Only Africans. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter the bank that comes. It does not matter your complexion. It does not matter how tall or short you are. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short to God's glory. So if you deny that reality, yeah. then the God who spoke that word, you tell him that you are a liar and not a sinner. But David tells us in Psalm 51, that we are conceived. Conceived. Oh, shit. In here. And our transgression is always. Where is it? You want to tell you? It never goes away. It's right there. So for you, can I talk to the young people in the room? Yes. Older people, can you just be loud a little bit? Yes. Chill. I do not make sure get on the phone and do different things. Let me talk to the young people. Don't let no one lie to you. We live in a world that is saturated with sin. There is darkness and there is light. In the darkness, there is sin. God is light. His aim and objective is to pull you out of darkness. But before you can do that, He wants you to acknowledge that you are a sinner. Are you with me? Are you with me? Do we have the young people on this side? 
Can I talk to the young people on this side? I'm not talking to the older folks because you already know that. We live in a world. There is sin. And sin is real. It can affect you. It can change your attitude. And the moment you understand that you are a sinner, the happier you will be. Now, let me get back to my question. Why is, why, why is the word denying the existence of sin? I'm about to finish. Why? The answer to the question is found in the definition of sin. Are you with me? Are we still together? I'm about to lose you guys. So let's join me now. You might be just join me. You might be your mind like, oh, we want my African chapter to be here. I'm going to die. So I'd rather you, I'd rather you enjoy me right now because I'm about to leave. Have this indulgence for a little bit here. The definition of sin is why the word is, 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 is denying sin. The Bible says sin is the transgression of God's law. You didn't get it. You didn't get it. You didn't get it. The Bible says sin is what? The transgression of God's law. So if the word that denies the existence of God acknowledges sin, guess what happened? They acknowledge God. Are you with me? So if they acknowledge that there is sin in the world, the most of us say there is a God in heaven. But because they don't want to acknowledge the God in heaven, they say there's no sin. So, I'm a Catholic chaplain. When the soldier do wrong, we send him to EDH. EDH? What the EDH is? EDH is there? You know, sir, I don't know. Some of the things are same problem. It's just straight up. It's the same problem. You cannot drink and drive and think that in the kitchen, you put the EDH in the food. Help it will not happen. If you drink and drop, you got pulled over, you will get a UCNJ and it will kick you out. Yeah. Even this cannot happen. Oh. You need Jesus. Yeah. You need Jesus. Yeah. So the Bible says, John argues that if we deny the existence of sin in our life, the light is not enough. We are staying in darkness and we don't have fellowship with the light. I'm telling you, I love this thing. On January 20, 28, 2010, Toyota announced a report. For those of you who are older, 2010 is like a year or decade or century away. But it's a serious. There was a nationwide recall. Why? Because the people said that the car had like auto acceleration. So when you're driving, the car will just explode out of the center. So Toyota, that's a serious problem. That start to drop, and people started getting rid of the Toyota, and people just, it's a serious problem. Millions and millions of people, they had to investigate, where is the problem coming from? So after a thorough investigation, the investigator found out that the problem was not a deal. There is something in your car called the black box. It's in the airplane, it's in shape, it's in the room. So the black box, whenever there is an accident or a problem, it kind of capture what happened in that moment. Are you with me? Yeah, yeah. You're not getting it. Can I say another thing? Are you understanding what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. You see, I'm an African. Don't forget that now. Yeah. If you don't talk back to me, I feel like I'm not getting a story. I keep repeating myself. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not here. That's the African thing. Understand that. So, the black bags capture the very moment before that collision or accident or whatever is reserved. It's protect, it protects that. So, the investigator went to all these vehicles and pulled out the black boxes. And when the investigator looked into it, they came to the conclusion that the problem is not a vehicle. The individual that was driving the vehicle <laughs> did not step on the bricks. <laughs> they made a mistake. Instead of stepping on the brick, they stepped on the accelerator and they went in the ditch. And they brought out the all three and they called them defective. The problem is you. You fail to acknowledge the sin problem. It has 
nothing to do with God. It has everything to do with you acknowledging that the problem comes from your life. So this morning, do you want to make God a liar? If you are here today, and you say, Chaplain, I have never acknowledged my sin. I can mind. I believe in the person that Chaplain did it. You got you got yours. Unless you want to go, you know. But, you know. I'm a sinner. There is no sin in my game. I'm a sinner. That's why I'm here. Because I know without the light, I will be a mess. That's why I'm trying to keep walking in the light. Because I know one moment, if I decide not to be in the light, I will be messed up. I want to extend an invitation to you. Meet our young people. Don't let your society lie to you. The Bible says, it says that if we confess our sin, we read that right. So, this is so beautiful. God is so perfect, right? So listen to this perfect God. He says that if you confess your sin, even though I'm perfect, but I'm willing to come down. I will forgive you. And not going to forgive you, I will please you. He said, I will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I will cleanse you for everything that is not good in your life. He said, if you come to me, our God will cleanse you. I have that power. So are you here today? And you said, Lord, I don't know. I don't know what to do. I'm confused. Well, this is the opportunity. And let's pray with you. You want to get baptized. You want to give your life to Jesus Christ. You want to acknowledge his death on Calvary. This is the opportunity. You want to get baptized and say, Lord, I want to start out fresh with you. I'm a sinner. I know it. Today, Lord, I just want to surrender to you. If you are that person, this is the opportunity. Tomorrow is not promise. You don't know what's going to happen to you. This is your opportunity to come and give your life to Jesus today. Do we have anybody here today? We say, Lord, I'm tired. I'm tired doing it by myself. I'm tired fighting by myself. Today, I just want to give it all to Jesus. I want to surrender to Jesus and give me my life. I do that person today. I just want to pray with you. Give me your hand and give your heart to me. Are you here today? Remember, he died for you. If only you knew what God went through for you. If only you knew what God desired for you. If only you knew how much he loved you. If only you knew the provision that I made for you to have salvation. You would be running down this path. If only you knew. How much God loves you. The Bible says He loves you so much so that He was willing to sacrifice His only begotten Son for you to have salvation. It is my prayer that you will make that decision sooner than later that you will come to Him and surrender your life. Because outside of Him, there is no life, He is the life. He is the light. He is the light. And he wants to stick with the walk in the light. I will now call the minister of God. If you're here today and you say, I want prayer, what a sickness, what a financial.